Hi everybody, thanks for coming. Hello uh, out there on the internet where the seven poets in, at Utopian Direction in Warwick, New York joining the global event 100,000 Poets for Change. This, my name's Harris Schiff and I remember 40 years ago when this reading might have been 100 Poets for Spare Change. <laughs> but but I, uh, a lot of things have changed since then and uh, it's no laughing matter. So uh, why are 100,000 poets getting together in 95 countries across the planet? Give or take a few thousand poets and maybe a couple countries? Because uh, we need urgent change in a lot of areas. Uh, part of the, this is also an opening of photographs by Monica, Claire Anthony, and Clark Fox. And the Uh, a celebration of a book by me with photographs by Monica uh, called One More Beat. Uh, uh, but it's mainly about the, the need for change. And uh, recently this building was flooded because of unprecedented rains. Yet people are denying climate change. Uh, we're having uh, major disasters like Fukushima, but there's no change in attitude. We need to change the channel. I'm gonna I'm gonna read a poem. We're going to read uh, short sets of four or five minutes, so you'll get different flavors of our poetry. And uh, I'm going to read a poem from 1996 called Update, that was an attempt to update Allen Ginsberg's great poem, America, from 1956 when it was written. And when he ended the, the poem with the line, Actually, I think his, the end of his poem was on putting my queer shoulder to the wheel. But he also said, America, go fuck yourself with your eye on the And at uh, that time, uh, he just written a howl as well, where he used the word fuck. And he was arrested for publishing the word fuck and had to go to, to, to trial to get the right to publish the word fuck. Then in 1996, I would take my kids to action movies where Arnold Schwarzenegger would like to be killing people and the dialogue, every other word was fuck. fuck. It was amazing. How did that happen? That's progress, right? That was real progress. That was real progress and I thought the poem I, there needed to be a, an update to America because that had changed and a lot of other things changed. And, and now there needs to be an update to this poem. So I might throw in a line. You'll notice which line is the update line. But basically this was uh, my attempt to update that poem, America. Update. America, now you can say fuck have sex, take drugs. So why give a fuck about the wretched and oppressed or the planet that burns under our feet? America, sure, grow your hair, have nudity. Here's all the forbidden. Plus, Game Gear, Game Boy, Super Nintendo, interactive TV, virtual reality, and you guys, on the other side of the barbed wire electrified border trench, don't bother me. America, get online. The chat rooms are sweet forgetfulness. 
here, have some multi-sensual CD-ROM interference. Entertain yourself. Here's a new video. Hey, check out these special effects. Head for the health club. Here's a iPhone, iPod, iPad, Mac Air. Sure. <laughs> Have any kind of sex with anyone you like. <laughs> Maybe you can even uh, have same-sex marriage in some places, possibly. Hey, smoke all the pot you want. Watch MTV. We'll make you some better beer. Hey, we were wrong about a lot of stuff. <laughs> Don't worry about Mexico. Hey, no. Don't you worry your pretty little head about Africa. Oh, by the way, we're sorry about your rent. <laughs> Here's a new portable CD virtual reality walk person that'll entertain you while you work that extra shift. Don't even think about the fields of flowers that could be food for the starving. Decorate your apartment. We're opening up some new markets. America, the best is yet to come. Keep working. <laughs>
chemical spin in a centrifuge called stop and the lid is hurled into space. Bone china, luminescence, smooth white skin of an innocent, embalmed and rest in peace, peace, the raven flies out of his skull. And then the next one is called the Sphinx at Sea. Your bare shoulders under the lamplight. Secluded nocturnal mountains of snow seen from a distance. As you board your gold seraphic boat, the thoughts beginning and beginning again. Recumbent rock car reading pages of Greek philosophy, the small pine island of the gods appears, a raw and brilliant emerald in its matrix. So crown the sea takes you away in her blue gloved arms. She takes you far from the keening choruses on the beach, beating time on harps and drums while the rain drives in your faces. And this next poem. Thank you. That's about my enigmatic husband. <laughs> For many decades, I had no idea what's on his mind. The Sphinx. Uh, and this last poem in this round is called The Red Tower. All these poems are based on paintings by the Kirikov. Uh, either the um, image of the painting or the title itself. And this is the Red Tower, which was uh, a painting called the Red Tower by Giorgio Chirico. And um, when I was writing this book uh, called Nostalgia of the Infinite, I was trying to investigate what the Chirico was think thinking when he wrote those, when he painted those fantastic paintings just before World War One that had such an influence on the surrealists. And he was studying Greek philosophy and Nietzsche. And this poem is about my own little condensation of Thus Spake Zarathustra. In a sea I lived, in solitude, and it bore me up on a wave over the marketplace, pacing like an injured animal that bore me up over a of a land of sleep and poison flies, a tower rising to the clouds of maleficence. My tongue in flames, my fountain overflowing in the cold night air while strong winds blew along the battlements. Naked stars, millions and millions of miles away. In the open heights, I could feel their light entering my skin. Above the din of buzzing flies, I rose above the parasites and bloodsuckers who drained me of my will. Swallowing fire, I climbed up to my universe with a flight of frozen songbirds in my heart. I'd like to now um, Introduce you to Tom White, our next poet. Spite haiku. Circles I made, thanking peach tree for its timely shade. You all know what haiku is. Two sparrows hop, man waters his garden, children romping in park. Summer Olympics, jostling the ice tray from sink to fridge. Outside in the rain, ends can't meet, bed springs propped up. Can you hear me out there? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Nine geese grazing in the green field, number 10, standing guard. Uh, this seems to uh, maintain the theme of uh, the day's event, the, uh, my sister's photo show and uh, Harris's uh, book debut. <clears throat> so like seeks like. The future silent as a warehouse. How exciting can you get? As I read a letter by Ted Berrigan to Joe Brainerd, I note his love of artists and poets was immense, and at the least, charitable with reasons to push pencils, formidable and floating on a raft of air. Ebenezer, slogging toward the hills, roll away what is mute, except for the one who has eyes in the stone, tear a long dotted line, push button for walk signal, exert yourself, better sweet than respected, to be squeezed like an accordion, extroverted in notes, ex carcass instrument. Keep rowing, streets no longer portable like darkness. Cows in your blood are stampeding. If you got hormones, you got an angle. The blue streak of the hills, shattering of birds and nothing more. Thrill pattern, 11 corridors of neurons leading to the mirror of the lake. It must be fussed over to clear the path, free of wrath, to be friendly to the crane in summer. Yesterday, have you ever heard Jackie Curtis pronounce the word eternal? Well, I have. And I've never been the same since. <laughs> ambience. Not ambiance, ambience. <laughs> Sounds flowers make are drones, tracked by the sun, heard on your feet under sky's blue dome. Affordable antics. Voices in leaves entreated to walk around the manor with measuring taps. Tape. Hey, I'll start again. Uh, affordable antics. Voices in leaves entreated to walk around the manor with measuring tape to pad hill and plain by night amid tree shadows, isometric proportions. You now matter in motion. Speak, Elohim, Elodali. We lay the concrete here, nothing but a hard sell, to say a design painted on our face. Enjoy a few games. I'll yield the floor. thousand poets for change. You know, an uh, issue like fracking, it seems to me like it's pretty simple. It depends on whether you value people or profits. And most issues uh, are really that clear. They, they get very fogged up. Well, uh, not much that I write has a, a political edge. I, uh, the first, this first little group, I'm going to do a few, though, that I uh, dug out that do, not the Later one. The first one isn't really even political, but everything's political, right? Hey. 
you can't step out of history. You're, you're stuck. Uh, I'll do uh, two and then uh, of mine a little translation, which is very political. Home of swimming pool, computer fan, red lights on every sound system, clocks, microwave, answering machine, <laughs> no desert father I, though demons crowd around, taunts of the electric sphinx who squats beside the pool, I'm busy, how about you? Computer fan imps and surge suppressors sing, use me and eat the world. Answering machine, dishwasher, VCR, every place I look, time's winged chariot is insect cold in clocks with relentless digital advance in concert, no effect toward outage and the end. And uh, I think I'll, I'll do this uh, old one, which was actually about uh, foreign policy. Uh, now you get, there's something else involved than profits and people with foreign policy, but uh, keeping troops at home would go a long way anyway. And this was uh, called uh, Tax Money Head South. I'm caught in a sorry scheme like that old tyrant, Oedipus. But no full-throated cry breaks the silence here. A dollar, already sour, with broken clocks and dyspepsia, lifts from the dresser, takes off like a butterfly, circles in sudden remembrance, and slips toward tropic sun, fluttering by a beach, where small and barefoot boys chase but never can quite keep up. It's drawn toward the tinkle of crystal against ice, the shuffling of linen napkins and the feet of servants in a vast patio of quiet talk, dinner parties, down dusty roads, boutiques near wet alleys, crunch, explosion, and final bone snap scream as a chandelier drops surprised in the foyer. The computer indicts me and starts to list the witnesses. The VCR, CD, fresh squeezed orange juice all give me up. And the angry blue corn tortillas call out Zapatista slogans from the kitchen. The cash nexus fills the room. My eyes remain intact, but it's impossible to see. And uh, the last bit I'll do uh, now is from uh, the German Expressionist poet, uh, Johannes Becker. And when I read my versions of Becker, I, I must explain how he was a Spartacist as a young man like, like Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht. He was a communist in Germany. Uh, he was an Expressionist uh, poet. He ran from the Nazis into the Soviet Union, where Stalin called him a Trotskyist and almost killed him. And, and event managed to somehow survive the war, made it back to Germany, where he became a Stalinist bureaucrat, repressing the young intellectuals like he had been all through his youth. Did anybody read the story about, about sex in the New Yorker that talked about how, how uh, Reich became a Republican in his own age? Oh, really? I didn't know. And, and the guy who's the head of the Reichian Institute now yeah. is this extreme right winger. And <laughs> anyway, this is uh, just a little bit from Johannes Becker's revolutionary expressionist poem from, it's about 1919, called Somebody Stands Up. Tell me, my brother, who you are. Rager. Raper, villain and cop, lying in wait. A glance on yellowed bones of your fellow men. You're a king, perhaps. An emperor, a general. Gold gobble. Whore of Babylon and degeneration. <laughs> Hate balling maw, fat purse and diplomat, or, or a child of God. Your modern fruits, people grown soulless and brutal. A ruler of the world, but your, your own most heavy burden. Hear me now. Make a change. Be brave and think. Man, you solitary stewer, hardly human, sinner, tax collector, brother and betrayer. Who are you? Turn in your grave. 
Stretch yourself. Desire yourself. Breathe. Make a choice at last. Evolve. Lemon farm or exile's thistle. Chosen island or swamp of thieves. Cellar of ruin. Illuminated prophet and Sinai of flames. Locomotives, rhythm, brakes, howling. Man, my brother, who are you? Sulfurous storm fills the evil azure space. The horizon of your desire is what pens you in. Down in the gore, chest up, head gone, torn off, mashed in the sewer's snout. Still, there's time. Everybody out, out in the street for revolution. Join the march, hit the street, hurry, leap from the Canaanite night. There's still time, man. Stand up, stand up. doing is contributing uh, the funds today to the uh, anti-fracking of uh, Catskills. And though I, I, do, I know little about fracking, uh, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't do it. At least not while I'm reading. Uh, I don't want to see any fracking going on out there. <laughs> New language, New York, September 15th, 1984. My flight lands in Newark, New Jersey from my hometown, Toronto, Canada. A shuttle to Manhattan, Friday night. Stepping out of Port 40. I don't even use this. Yeah. It's the wire. It's the wire. It's the wire in motion is going to make sense. It's the fracking. Yeah. The fracking is <laughs> getting us. It's that yeah. damn fracking yeah. business. Yeah. Let me start again. <laughs> New language. New York, September 15, 1984. My flight lands in Newark, New Jersey from my hometown, Toronto, Canada. A shuttle to Manhattan. Friday night. Stepping out of Port Authority bus terminal. Sup, yo, sup. <laughs> huh? I turn. Yo, yo. What is yo? I, I, never, I never heard yo. <laughs> Few more paces and I'm out the door. 42nd Street, wham, the lights come hit me. Wham, the lights come hit me. Sounds, shouts, something tears by, cops everywhere. Sense, sense, sense. Here comes another yo guy. Sup, yo, wanna buy some sense? He means sense of me a weed. It's supposed to be the best. I've had it, it's good. This isn't it. <laughs> Can't even trust drug dealers anymore. <laughs> sense, sense, sense. You want to buy some sense, yo? No, man. I got plenty of sense. I got more sense than you'll ever have. <laughs> I quietly say under my breath. Smack! Some guy hip checks me on his way to score some sense. How rude. Plenty more rudeness to come. An actress girlfriend later tells me I'm too polite to live in New York. And now, I've just arrived from Canada. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Because Canadians are always sorry. <laughs> More lights, lights flashing, lights flashing past me, lights with sirens, some with invitations. Hey baby, you want a date? <laughs> she wants to date me. <laughs> hey honey, you want to go out with me tonight? They all want to take me out. <laughs> Must be my Canadian charisma. I must exude Canadian culture. Drives the chicks wild. Anyway, you never saw hookers like this before. You've heard of good girls gone bad. Well, these are bad girls rotten. Lights, sirens, horns, junkies, hookers, barbed wire, drunks, cops, smack, pushing, homeless, piss, 
broken glass, boarded up, battened down, my kind of town. <laughs> Hostile welcome. In the East Village, cent, 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 sold right out of bodega storefronts. Bodegas are Hispanic delis, if you didn't know. And if you did, then you probably know you can buy drugs in this town. And beer sold in delis, carried out in little brown bags. It's the brown bag law. You can drink beer out of little brown bags right in open view. Mm -hmm. Not really. I mean, the brown bag law is long gone, but we pretend because we like drinking beer out of little brown bags. <laughs> Wouldn't you? <laughs> yo, yo, me saying yo now. One hour in New York, already I speak the language. <laughs> Yo, yo, still Canadian though. Yo, yo, excuse me. Excuse me, yo, yo, I'm sorry. Excuse me, yo. <laughs> Did not get the welcome I somehow expected. I get glares though. I get stares though. I get glares and stares that can burn holes right through you. Eyes, relentless, still, cold, stone, killer eyes. Shark eyes, eyes without compassion, eyes without mercy. Not the welcome I somehow expected. This is not Canada. This is New York City, 1984. Evening portraits, sticks. He was neither highbrow nor lowbrow. He was without brow entirely. He was the man without the eyebrow. Browless by choice. Shaved, disposable, Gillette clean and proud of it. We'll call him Sticks. Sky high, lanky, long, lean. Eyeglass specs, 1950s, detective black. The nerd look without intention. An oddity, this lanky, browless spectacle with his ponytail straight lightning rod to the earth, clad neon purple coat, punctuated by East Village night punk black, and a stroll that replicated dangerous oblivion, wandering without notice, protected by an inner light and innocence of the foolish child, masked by an outward rebellion with allegiance to no man, a man on a pointless adventure without destination, without guidance, and without reason. An enlightened being present in the now, contemplation fixed on the shuffle of his own heel-worn motorcycle boot, and a hankering for a sweet cup of sweet craft caffeine. The night. Oh, the night, this sidewalk shuffle of the lured adventure leads us and lures us into a little trouble. Not too much trouble that one can't enjoy the ride but enough trouble that we know we're not entirely safe. I mean, what is safety anyway? An illusion of protection from that which might not get us if we look the other way? But let's pretend we have some control. Light another cigarette and stroll. Whistle, if you will. Drag your heels and feign a drunken stumble of I don't care. Put it on, put on the I'm street smart and tough and nothing can get me, go ahead, if that'll make you feel safe. Venus. I saw her standing in the smoky light of the market doorway. A single bulb overhead illuminated a black leather corset, torn latex at the knees, and boots that jacked her up another six inches. A towering nightingale of flesh and wonder. All you had to do was pay for it. Robbie. Robbie had a strut that was no more indifferent than any other ex-junkie Vietnam vet. Still thin, strung out fashion for the East Village, he scowls. We're approached by a very intimidating homeless man. He's six feet high. I stand aside. Hey, Spanny change. No. Robbie rumbles. Come on, man. Just a little change. I said no. The six-foot man backs up. Sorry, man. And he stumbles away. Robbie shoots me a look as if to say, you gonna fuck with me too? 
And then he continues his monologue on Nietzsche's theory of existentialism. Thank you. Newtonian deduction. Deriving my calculations, the square root and acid taste from the pit of my stomach parallel to the base of my spine, the integral section of my confession. Branching out into the building blocks, supporting structures, aminos and placebos, my ribs, not the cage, and this time and space, I fixate on gravity. Gravity and the super collider, colliding and colliding, random and order, order and random. And ever since, I've been equally attracted to refracted light as to numerical fractions. The rainbow totaled in my eyes. Pythagoras' theorem composing my size, synaptical thought streams, these swirling permutations the comets scream about. Oh dear God, gravity, you make me pray to Newton, begging him to subtract the ton of bricks from his name, to conjure the old back into the sage, to petition the poles for release, this force field fortress of applied formulas, all weighing down on the base of my spine, base of my brain. I never crack. I only twist and bend, contemplating pi in this infinite sky where we never die and there is no end. Pulling down the universe as we attempt to ascend. Only statistics rise and rise, all of the brilliant minds going blind, seeking illusions as the fitting fluids to fill our flasks forsaking centuries of answers to the riddles in fog and haze, resting rate versus pulsating pace, making for the final strokes on the canvas we demanded to create, mass multiplied by weight, countless souls across time mislaid the date, amnesiacs of fate, relativity a theory too complex against the Simple solution, poisonous substitutions, the masses masticated. The rock stars, a geological and cosmic matter, plastic clatter, bread of chaos. Faster than the speed of mechanical navigations and fiber optics, please welcome Fender and Static, the cataclysmic concert for the classically cataphatic, coalesced forces forming electrified lights. We've all yearned for a night out. We've reconciled the cloud of the seismic fault in our size. We've perfected the math multiple times. Oh, Newton, silly Orwell prophesied two plus two would someday equal five, but you and I both know we are well past the time where subscribing to changing equations would alter the structure of existence as if a single number could throw history and it's making off course as if a single number could be stronger than centrifugal force. Gravity shakes her weary head, overwhelmed and infinitely burdened to hold billions who cannot understand the power of one. All words are verbs. All words are verbs, screaming meaning from behind walls of definition, deafening the sounds, vibrations, speaking volumes more than any library could hold, folding truths inside layers of perception, creating comprehension. All words are verbs. All words are verbs, entombing pantoums, mummifying poems, crystallizing prose, literary libations vertically spilling out of our mouths, running adjacent to facts, wallowing in misplacements, swallowing nouns and projections of reason, skipping adjectives like stones, forcing present tense past its physical home, granting freedom to roam. All words are verbs. All words are verbs, doubling my entendres, dividing sounds into sonatas, constantly compressing consonants upon vowels, dissecting sentence bone into letterless marrow, the wingless, flightless sparrow, alphabetically transformed into the worded bird, soaring with a promise from the source to remind us 
All words are verbs. And my last piece for this round is The Sky Inspires Without Want. The sky inspires without want, rakishly ravishing yet so wholly humble. I spiral myself into childish coil, basking its blue blanket as cover, warm, tucked, safe, cowering in cotton cloth clouds. The sky inspires without want. The sky inspires without want. Such divinity within poets, yet only with gentle gestation bold births beseech the beast to quiet. Even source of scribes scraping its surface cannot scratch the sublimity of such words. The sky inspires without want. The sky inspires without want. I cry, my wise, wrap me in wind, give me serenity in sky, but oh, how the riddle persists. As I struggle and insist, the sky inspires without want. Next, please welcome Marina Mati. I'm glad to be among people who care about what we're raising money for. Um, fracking is uh, fracking is literally ingesting poison into the earth and in the process using tons of water and um, in the process of poisoning water that's in aquifers, streams, uh, poisoning the animals, domestic animals as well as wild animals. Um, people's health have gone down in areas that have fracking. Um, and it was, of course, the technology of Halliburton. So um, I, we've been doing, the industry tends to say 30 years worth, we, we've had no problem. But that was vertical fracking. This is horizontal fracking, and Halliburton um, devised that technology. And we know how great they are at cutting corners. <coughs> so I'm hoping that I have it in me to um, I mean, I think we should be occupying our state capitals, actually, against everything that's going on. So I um, hope we have it in me to do that at some point. This was inspired by um, Dick Cheney's smile. A <laughs> smile. <laughs> I finally came to the title, Blot. Can you hear it in that? His mouth curled up like dried paper. And as his smirk settled over America, a blot appeared. At first concentrated behind his parched flesh, hidden behind closed doors. Then, like oily seas, instead of transparency, the darkness grew deeper, blotting out the flourishing sun. But slowly, under a low flame, dark frogs thrived and sang. One crow after another landed in treetops. Others, whose ground had been stained, horrible stains, gathered evidence we've been standing at the edge of our graves, carefully distracted from the chasm below. And ravens gathered feathers shimmering with memory filled the sky, screamed. I, I, I tried to, I'm trying to disperse light stuff with the heavy stuff, because even I get tired of this like, I just can't, I can't do it anymore. <laughs> so anyway, this is on Route 747. Peepers. Gravity, gravity burping stars, swelling cosmic regeneration, horny rhythm of sperm, reflections of silence, blood song of mud and muck, 
swoon of water, womb, quicksilver slip. Thanks. This is untitled. I think I have a title, but oh well. Mottled moon topples off dead limb. Storm winds thrash. Trees bow and tremble. Confusion over sanity and God. Squall applauds chaos. Steals topsoil and car fluids both. Sun returns to wound. Glistening green, deceitful. Sparrows hysterical twitter. There are flowers eating flowers, and I am supposed to live. This is Migrant, Migrant Angel. Actually, this is entitled after a painting, and I've never seen the painting, and I was in Janet's class, and this was the um, title she gave me to write. Um, migrant angel. Her birth, not of the womb, she is water shadow, roams according to the season of humanity, carrying weatherous turmoil within her. She takes people plucked of their pleasures down, down into a hole she's burrowed little by little for thousands of her years. An escape from the sun, light that for other angels is a source of illumination makes her invisible. It is darkness she needs to illuminate potential. She takes people down this wondrous trail, people of a certain season, but if she errs and they are not ready, they run stones and dirt thundering behind, hating and fearing this trickster with wings. When her wings become soiled and droop after these travails, she cleans like an insect grooming, flies to the other side of the moon. There she visits a certain boulder, and under that boulder is a frozen water pool, the only place she can see herself, and stays as long as she is allowed. When she is called back to Earth, she continues to search for someone in their ripening, guides them through, lets them know. And the last one for this set, uh, going through spiritual turmoil, this came out of that, and I'm not quite out yet. <laughs> God's cut toenail. God's cut toenail is in the sky tonight. There must be others out there. We see only one at a time. Your mind is wholly evident, transparently incomprehensible. Instability, your favorite state. Why have psychologists been silent about this? Infinity tells me you do nothing but play. Must be fun to play in your playground. But you're no fun to be with. No, I wouldn't call you fun. The human line is spinning itself out, taking hundreds of species with it. You're talking to us, but hardly loud enough to pierce the noise of minds and bodies you gave us. We hope, we suffer, perhaps we cause an allergic reaction for our creator. Or maybe you're still experimenting, searching for your identity. Thus, we have many versions, and you won't pick one. After all, you have forever. I wish, or should I pray, you do. I toss in waves of bed sheets drowning in your experiment as you hold creation up to the light. Thanks, Maria. You were, you were, talk, you were talking about uh, Occupying state capitals to oppose fracking, which uh, incidentally, the natural gas industry admits that uh, the amount of gas that they'll extract from the whole Marcellus Shale area 
will be just a drop in the bucket for the energy needs of, of the country. And uh, at the same time, it will cause irrevocable damage to our watershed. And the environment. So it's unbelievable that we can't stop it. Hell no, we won't go. I don't hear that anymore. One, two, three, four. We don't need your endless war. But Forty years ago, millions of Americans went to Washington, occupied the Capitol. I don't really know if the demonstrations uh, stopped the war or it was finally the impeachment of Nixon. But today, uh, who has time to go to Washington and demonstrate? Uh, can't even afford the trip. <laughs> so, why would poets He's speaking out for change. 100,000 poets for change around the planet. Well, we're idealists and dreamers. We can't tell you. We don't uh, write about how to do it. But, well, a global ceasefire would be a good idea. Mm -hmm. I just saw a web page for a global truce, I think on September 21st, 2012. There's an organization working towards the concept of a global truce. Just, okay, stop shooting, let's talk about it. It's a great idea. How will you implement it? Well, that will take uh, diplomats and more. Can it happen? Running out of time. That's why 100,000 poets, give or take a few thousand, mm -hmm. are reading today around the planet and uh, transmitting their readings on the internet in the hope that we can get something going. This poem is called Footnote to Yesterday. Bleat of the pavement beaters, carbon eaters, smoke, dust. Memory is in the Outer Bank. Chase Manhattan right out of town. The pot of gold sold. Old Pat. Angola says, ouch. Kinshasa Highway seeds. After Marx, the workers are united in their desire to have lunch. <laughs> Clear Channel. Clear Channel is the name of a company that during the Reagan era acquired a huge swath of radio stations and used it to promote a fundamentalist uh, Christian agenda and the Rush Limbo show. Also, millions of billboards. And I don't know if it's still called Clear Channel, but I'm sure it's still there. The beginning of this poem is taken from Wired magazine, uh, two th an issue in 2000. Wired home, living digital. How to turn your home into the center of the networked world. Entertainment everywhere. The ultimate remote control. Unplugging your office. DIY homeland security. Zagat guide to high tech cooking. Big LAN on campus. More. My people don't worry about the toxic, wasteful, ruined environment. 
stay indoors. <laughs> and in your home, enjoy the amazing and extremely profitable virtual environment we are growing for you constantly. Love the Fuhrer. <laughs> It really kills me that my, my generation, the boomers, who, uh, the big hippie generation, everything was supposed to be natural, we well, supposed to grow old naturally, you know? And, and uh, uh, it's just, it just kills me. It's just become a, such a plastic world. And um, I thought, you know, I was safe as a poet, you know, because um, no one cared what I looked like as I got older. But uh, apparently that's changed, you know? So anyway, I'd uh, like to see an end to that. Whatever happened to people like, uh, you know, Dame Margaret Rutherford, you know, like Miss Marple, you know, no one cared that, you know, she had, you know, you know, uh, jowls and what happened, you know. So anyway, that's that. Uh, that was on my list. <laughs> so I'll uh, now do the second uh, set. Thank you for that. This first poem is called Lost Ceilings. I basically try to write about what, what is it, the essence of being a human being. And uh, you're certainly not going to find it sitting in front of a television set or texting all day and tweeting and uh, all these things. And this is about a uh, typical night for me in the mid-70s mid or even the early 80s, uh, just sitting home alone uh, writing. It's called Lost Ceilings. Mirror, mirror on the floor, how the sharp silver slivers reflect the truest likeness of the soul, splintered in significant pieces on the edge of this world, a little haunted tonight. The four white walls of the hermitage surround a polar diorama, a landscape of ice interrupted by a pocket of desk lamp light and the hand of an anchorite, a lantern, Fra Angelico's Annunciation, the Horse Nebula, composed of gas and dust, the Pyramids of Giza, picture postcards circumscribed by amber glow, picture postcards left behind at the entrance to an uncharted network of inland seas, soaring winds over ch choppy water away from this world, the genie of the alphabet rises out of the typewriter this rosary of fire 26 beads of blood for 26 letters to fly in the face of finitude half obscured the telephone receiver lies on its side under a mexican shawl muffling its sound such solitude as afflicts the room tilted on an angle unassailed on the cusp of darkness. The bookshelves and the tall, thin clouds are a heavenly trove of torches, burning pages, paths, and spirals, labyrinths, lighting the way to a desert birthplace, far, far away from this world, in the midst of an ocean of sand. The genie of the alphabet rises out of the typewriter with this horn of plenty serenading the lost ceiling of stars with high notes. charging at my back. 
The life principle was so winded and collapsing, it gave birth to new life. I heard the blood pulsing in the stars. I heard the grinding of titanium teeth. I heard the night chanting, rain, 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 simulating the sound of water lapping against my walls. I heard the sheer numbers of the night and its dark belly, a desperate rhythm of sleep. So forgive me for walking away with the flame. And, um, this next poem of this round, my final poem for this round, is called Real Fire. And, uh, here at the Northeast Poetry Center, we, uh, aside from orphan courses, we uh, publish a, an annual review, and this is our first review. And uh, we're in the process now of putting together a second. And I'd like to read my poem from this, this review. It's also on the subject of fire, my surreal concept of fire. It's called Real Fire. Real fire is the central anthem calling birds to free themselves from tapestries. Real fire has a secret known only to the confederacy of firstborn supernova. Real fire is a single torch, signal torch, carried into the future by the children whom nobody leads. Real fire is a slip of a girl dancing in a window before the bloody phalanx of thorn. Real fire lays down its weapons to worship brittle trees and light grasses at night. Real fire burns its bridges to impede the progress of the orchestra conducted by rain. Real fire leaves a mark in the roses clinging to every balcony in the poet's city. Real fire resurrects in cycles of 500 years from the ashes of its predecessors. Real fire knows neither dignity nor pride when courted by the angels of the wind. Oh, that's all. <laughs> Tom, before you read, we have uh, Bayet, who uh, started the, the uh, anti-fracking uh, group that we're trying to help here in the Catskills. Hi, uh, my name is Bayet Curl. I got involved with fracking because I live in the epicenter of it, which is in uh, Hancock, New York. Uh, it's where the Millennium Pipeline comes through. So any place the pipeline is, is where there's going to be fracking. Now, Pennsylvania basically had, in their history, had not created many uh, regulations against it. So fracking uh, kind of started that way and is coming towards the New York State. Now, New York State, uh, it's fighting it tremendously uh, because of the fact that one of the men on the city council is actually an engineer. And he's been fighting it for, for some time now, and very factually. Uh, but, I mean, he had people uh, at City Hall, a uh, member of the uh, DEP, who basically, these guys are, I mean, they're, they're, they're not paid off, but they're, they're written to the government. The, Department of Environmental Protection wants fracking. They're behind fracking. So they're not representing you. And when you see these lovely commercials on national television, yeah. and this guy with the smile, yeah. you want to just like wipe off his face. He's basically trying to convince you that yeah. all, all the chemicals 
are going down below the ground, thousands of feet below where the water table is. The issue is, when you frack, you frack with water and chemicals, it goes down, but guess what? To get the, to get the gas, it has to come back up again. And when they get that material, a lot of that, that uh, water then, which is contaminated, is put in pools. Those pools are like giving off to the air constantly. Not only that then, then they're trucked. Now the whole trucking industry is, is like, uh, you know, they're like cowboys. Because these guys have been known in, in Pennsylvania many times to just take their trucks in the middle of the night and just dump it in the street. They're also selling fracking water because of its chemicals in the water to de-ice villages' streets. Their the villages are paying for this fucking water. It's, you can believe it. Uh, we have Obama, who wants to have a political agenda of, of creating more energy for this country, so somehow he feels, oh, what a great, uh, you know, interim kind of energy policy we could have. Uh, Como had completely changed his, his mind. Well, when he was first running, he was middle of the ground because he didn't want to commit because of his uh, campaign. Then we all thought that you know he was going to get the DRBC to continue the investigation of what the regulations are really going to be. Well, suddenly he kind of reversed himself, and and the DRB said, "Okay, we're putting the, we're putting this out now," which doesn't allow enough people or enough time to actually make the investigation a reality. And the only reality is is the people who have created the websites and who have created the work, uh, you know the. Uh, word by word that, that you know, there are issues and that they're, they're starting to really uh, come, up, come, to the, come to the top in terms of, you know, their campaigning against it. And so, I mean, that's the only way you can do it because you have to kind of bring it to the light of, of politicians. It's like you've got to take the politicians from first base to second base to defend, defend the laws that are already there because they, they won't do it. Politicians won't do it. I've been fighting like City Hall in New York. We're suing Trump because of the hotel in Soho, and um, it's the you know the city's breaking their own laws just because they want business, and that's what it's about. You know, it's it's purely profitable and and, and nothing else. Uh, I did a campaign also with some other friends to stop the power lines that were going to come right through this area also, and uh, I mean basically it's the it's the government saying we need energy, so somebody creates that that notion. They create then uh, people who go, okay, somebody's, somebody then actually do that for us. And then you get like these kind of cor corrupt businesses that become those people who get chosen to do it. And then they just go in there and go out and they do it as fast as they can and they just maul right over you. I mean, the only reason why New York State right now is ahead of the game is because we provide the water to Manhattan. And Manhattan cannot afford to filter that water just cannot afford it, and everybody knows it. And then plus they know that um, in court, they would lose against New York City. And that's what you have to tell Hess and the other oil companies, that it's simply not gonna be profitable for them to do it. Yeah. That's basically what you have to do. So yeah. it's tough. Anyway, that's enough. Thank you. Thanks, Ted. Tom Wigel. I want to say to the They used to say Wigel on the bell in New York. Can't go home anymore, right, John? Can't. No. Can't no. Can't keep the water. Pretty bad in Connecticut, actually. There's just no respect for water at all, and period. One, these are sonnets, these people that you'll hear in this sequence. Except for airports long ago, the hugging season never was. So, my dear, I'm happiest when my mind is co-opted in this weak carcass reading you. 
sorted out from artifacts who, who turn out to be people who would sit in libraries and read books like ancient Romans reading entrails before battle. Transparent me, raising chain link line before putting up the coffee. I recall the fireflies' bright salute, the snoring haze of the honeysuckle pad. This sucker's not working. No, it's not. It's not. I mean, it's worse than. No, it's okay. You just can't move the wire and post a vote. Okay. We can hear you though. Turns out, yeah, but I like to hear me, oh. so I know where I'm at. Okay. Okay. No, it's not label mania. It's just. Gentlemen, the black cat will dine at noon. <laughs> Trust not in the things you hear, but only what comes out of them. I note the absence of primary colors. See standards higher than the divine. Not with herb tea, but the sword comes the one who likes to say, it is written. So it rains on a parade. The attention span of the gnat is worth achieving. Though I met only blank stares in the cave of the winds. Three. Coincidence is good, but literacy is better. <laughs> Paper Ridge. Pe sorry, I'm starting again. Paper Ridge really does sound great, though. It's Pepperidge farm bread. <laughs> 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 um, remembers linemen for the county. Sometime you don't want to rock the boat. So you keep seated. Though it has cost me the best two lines of my life entering Bridgeport. It's how the bread crumbles for anyone reading. Sorry. Just start again. For anyone wearing red in May. And even if I bomb in New Haven, just standing around in a college try. I'm sorry, this print is so uh, a fake bohemian, smudgy, smudgy print. It's like, you know, but it happens to be number two, and I like my own typing better than this. It's like, you know, like fitted jeans. This is pseudo bohemian clock keys. You don't understand how cruel this is right now. <laughs> Say this, that's my turn. Submarine engineer in Rotten, Connecticut. One time only press. You only get one shot, that's it. You only get one edition, too. Uh -huh. <laughs> Can I start again? Yes. All right, good. Three. And I'll chop some time out of them for my part, uh, my round. Coincidence is good, but literacy is better. Pepperidge Farm bread remembers Lyman from the county. Sometimes you don't want to rock the boat, so you keep seated. Though it has cost me the best two lines of my life entering Bridgeport, it's how the bread crumbles for anyone wearing red and nay. And even if I bomb in New Haven, just standing around is a college try. <laughs> Blackbirds on cloud nine, everything's going my way. <laughs> I think I have time for one more, so I'm just going to keep this a sonnet sequence, if you don't mind. Four. Sound of Eric Dalty changed everything in my kitchen, metaphysically speaking. <laughs> Broke the fog in me, 
for a Tuesday night event of shrouds, past retrieving, I thought, better than a notebook, I like a blank now, smooth and iconoclastic. I catch it like Dolphy, the opposite of plastic. If principle makes people look before they leap, you have, you, you have a right to hear about it. rereading uh, Dao De Jing in a new translation, and I think it's just the fourth verse, he says, uh, when people come to desire things that are hard to get, they immediately become thieves. You just didn't desire those things to begin with. You know? yeah. Yeah. Dead trees in the forked arms of their fellows that followed, not eyes wide with utter unbelief like Comrades in war, unable to believe their neighbors gone. The forest floor has generations layered like old Troy, back and back to time's get-go. And each supports the next, till in the ultimate sub-basement, the elevator operator lifts one wry eye, the door slides, the secret's out, and all distinctions fade. Then everything relaxes, all lets go, no longer any gap from one to one. The manic dance may pause, so brief, between exhale, inhale, before time's arrow, like some god of locomotives, blows its lonely whistle and speeds on down the line as though the terminus must hold that counter where one could sit and order anything one wants. So well worth racing toward. The morning still recalls the dark. I feel night's fingers yet. But the sun's beams travel like commuters, earnest and bored. The glandular summer's pushing on. Some fruits hang heavy today, and send to space a sweet perfume, like Grandpa's gypsy melody on a scratchy 78, whiff of childhood bluegill gasping, and school steps shaped by reluctant shoes, like warm papaya flesh, too, in tropic sun, when my own flesh was soft. Now spent cells settle all about the house. A subliminal gray begins to blush on every side. The sage old lilac knows that scent. The sweet decay of living things. The dark and vampish foreigner brought cakes from far and banished all their hands from the cookie jar. So Wells bought cheap bought fine rock. Oh, their bubbles in the bouillon caught in bluery, though the saints cannot restore them when they're once set free. And uh, finally, uh, two and again. The lost squirrel accelerates down the taut line. Men in suits with onion eyes. Sound of a subway's agony. A galaxy with a sheen like a curl of hair. Rocks rise by the road like bubbles from champagne. And warmth rises from your skin to make life possible again today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Michael Shaw and Collins, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Brooklyn. Yeah. 
Brooklyn. Williamsburg, Brooklyn. In those days, 1980s, is many years yet from becoming hip. It's still just remote, desolate, and empty. It's still just <laughs> odd. Like walking down Bedford Avenue, beehive hairdo ladies and windows watching me, staring me with squint eyes, like the dissection of a curious specimen. One bellows, excuse me! I turn. She's hanging out of her street-level apartment window and she's wearing a multicolored nightgown or moo moo or some <laughs> such garment. <laughs> it's synthetic and flowery and tied with little strings around and under one of the folds of her neck. I'm immediately reminded of a Mad Magazine character from the early 1970s. <laughs> this neighborhood is colorful without question, but nowhere near safe. I'm told in the early days there were bullets whizzing down these quiet blocks and the walk-in refrigerator at Frankie's Corner Deli was once used to store those who caught the bullets. Which is nice of Frankie's to provide that community service, really. <laughs> there was a neighborhood watch, too. One night, some poor, unsuspecting passerby of incorrect skin tone made the grave error of borrowing a woman's purse from Uncle Vito's bar. When he later got torn down from the barbed wire fence he got caught up in while attempting to flee Uncle Vito patrons, he was praying for the cops to arrive. Because that night, all the neighborhood men got to show their stuff. Got to show off their new Rocky Balboa moves from the recently released Rocky III. A movie that helped to awaken their late night proclamations of bloody glory. Hey, I got a couple of kicks in. Hey, Vinny, what did you get? I bashed his head. I bashed his fucking head. Oh, well, it was a bonding experience. <laughs> And nobody was prouder than my landlord, Paul A.T., who runs numbers for the mob, looks very sharp in his white polyester tracksuit like it was custom made for him. <laughs> and I think it might have been. I must confess, his name was not really Paul E.T. I have changed his name to protect myself. <laughs> and there's a guy named Ace who lives on the corner. I mean, literally never leaves the corner refers to me as the movie star. Ace has no teeth, but he does have emphysema that he's trying to self-remedy by smoking a couple of packs of camels a day. He'll always invite me, he'll always ask when I will invite him up for tea. Hey, Collins, movie star, come here. I always want to tell him, Ace, you want to talk to me, you cross the street, and you come here. <laughs> but I don't have the nerve. <laughs> Movie star! <laughs> when are you going to invite me up for tea? <laughs> I'm not sure why he calls me Movie Star. I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher for the New York City Police Department. It's my job to help keep the kids on Alphabet City in Manhattan's East Village occupied with theater games so they have less time to play with their box cutters. <laughs> Although they had time to pull it out on me one snowy winter afternoon, when I was genuinely concerned that they were not wearing gloves or mitts because it was cold, being Canadian. <laughs> we know something about cold and dressing for it. Why aren't you guys wearing gloves? I ask. Well-intentioned, perhaps, but naive. Because clearly these children's parents were unable to supply them with proper winter wear when they only had a few dollars left for a couple of rocks of crack. So it was then the Alphabet City children turned on me. We don't need gloves, they say, because we're going to take yours. And the blade 
comes up. A moment of quiet anticipation and the hush of something unspeakable lingers between them and me as it fills the corner of 12th Street and Avenue B. Anticipation. Not exactly anticipation like front row seats at SeaWorld waiting for Can Do the Whale to appear. <laughs> but anticipation nevertheless. I'm suddenly filled with courage. I decide to break the army of silence. You're going to cut me for these gloves? I say. They cost $2.50 on St. Mark's Place from the sock man. Is it worth it to you? I say. Long pause. Pregnant pause. Nah, we're not going to take them, they say. And the blade goes back in the pocket. I am so cool. <laughs> I get a block away and my knees start to wobble. The blood leaves my face and the breakfast leaves my belly. Anyway, I don't know why Ace on the Corner refers to me as the movie star. I'm just a teacher for box cutter kids. So the beehive hairdo moo moo lady, as I'm casually strolling down 7th Street, yells from her first story apartment window, Excuse me! Are you from England? I pause for a moment, not sure how to respond. And then I do. Ah. Uh, yeah, I'm from England. I knew it, she says. I can tell. And I swear I'm not making any of this up. I can tell, she says, by the way you walk. So this is where I live. I'm not sure why. Apparently it's because I walk like an Englishman, but I stand out. So the point is, in those days, these are not yet, I think I might enjoy a 3 a.m. stroll <laughs> kind of neighborhoods. Thank you. <laughs> Not billowing, not drowning, 
Water, water, water crashes in and then out. It takes and it gives without any doubt. Water and water will never be blood. Blood quivers too much in the shadow of such a tall order. This order in the court of processing jesters dwindles in the quake of a pretty jester. Order has been yielding to chaos in a senseless dance, but chance still knows it is in the making and never in the giving or in the taking. It exists only in the questions that we dare to ask, the true culmination of our past. Ritual contrition. Ritual contrition aches beginning, nutrition to grow, exponentially exceed the crow, dark and beckoning in midnight ebb, afraid of the clearing discern in the outpour of dead. Ritual contrition bleeds day you mom, leaking burgundy bone, once flesh, refreshed by tear clouds, rain frowns, poppies for rest, still the dead. Ritual contrition begs scarred tissue, recants, denies, untied, vows unsaid, candle blown by wind swept sky, uncovers all lies. My final poem is. called San Andreas. My flesh a shedding, sculpting skin, too fast to the dress, although 123 years past fate. My rest in the grave, stark state, an abrupt brief flash, my slumber to an early wake, a break in date, arriving on the late. A fracture in tectonic plates, I begged San Andreas to wait. But saints are eternally set in their ways, command perpetual haste. I, mere messenger, forest ranger of Nazareth, flung from fiery chariot, bleeds flame, bleeds name, bleeds until freeze will frame. Ice of our blood, ice of our blood. Pits and myths, Chiron and Fitz, a river for Euphrates, a gate for masses held in Hades, an ice chain link sinks. A thinking race will blink before a thirsting eye, an eye that sheds to bear witness, an eye that blinds to hold crimson, an eye that dies to buy Christmas, a soul that lies to bear children, and I am barren in these fruitful times. I come to mourning having already died, I have burned one thousand times, these stakes still hold my shape. My breath breathes from the palms of ashen trees. My death fills every funeral pyre beneath the mire. And it's your God on the wire. It's your God on the wire. And it's my bird taken flight. It's my bird taken flight in the flame of cast out light, in the darkness of infinite night. I begged. San Andreas to wait. The anger is deep, so is the grief. 
I'll have to drill. If I don't do it carefully, it might spill, might burst, maybe a torrent and it won't stop. BP, you want your life back. We wake up every morning with your slick news. An ache, cold as cement. Beaches are closed to reporters. Beaches are open to swimmers. And you want your life back when it's all over. It is all over. BP, I'm having trouble getting this out of my system. It's collecting behind my diaphragm, moving up towards my throat. I wish I could vomit. Crying won't help. It'll only cap the anger. My mind keeps telling me to keep going, reassuring me it's in charge, but this is heading to the gulf between my shoulder blades. There is no cure, only treatment by leeches. BP, the poison's been happening all along, like a frog in slowly heated water. That's not a new metaphor. And now we're swimming in toxins. My flesh is swimming in it. My sandbar organs, my dolphin heart, my plankton brain are swimming in it dying in it and someone's telling me it doesn't hurt it won't hurt you duck under your desk it won't hurt you but this is no drill this is the oil industry's chernobyl oh bp this is too much are you losing any sleep i woke up with this too as many of us do they don't have to tell me i can only give you hell on paper but crosses on the lawn of a coast town each one with names of animals dead their way of life dead, the 11 people dead, and their families? We'll be there on film and it won't go away. No, this won't go away. There'll be investigative globs around you and your files like flies on a carcass beached black. Oh God, the Gulf is dying. BP, what's the solution? This isn't the solution. I'm a poet. I'm here to document a journey. What can I do? Where do I go? Paper and ink, I'm angry, we're angry. What do we do, where do we go? I'm in a whirlpool of toxic thoughts against you, against us, against the government. What good is that? Not constructive. Do I get out of my car and walk? Why won't you let go? Let go! We depended on you and you've betrayed us. What does that mean? I'm anxious, worried, sick. I get into my car and make a living. I'm not gonna be a planet walker. Where is the government? Why weren't they there to begin with? Don't depend on government, don't depend on oil industry, don't depend on cars. What do we drive? Who do we drive? Where's the drive? We the people are all alone. We the earth are stranded. We're not prepared to go to another planet. I'm not willing to leave earth on the scrap heap. Movies give us two versions, a utopian future, a dystopian future. They both have heroes. Am I a hero? Are you a hero? There is no hero. BP, do you feel the gulf? Do you feel the grief? Can we bargain with something like that? With something like you? You who are not a personhood because you won't be handcuffed, taken to prison for sabotage, for terrorist activity, for damaging property, life, and limb. You are a thing and we should treat you like a thing. Things have no soul, have no feelings, and are tossed, recycled, and burned when we're done with them. BP, this is heading for you. This rogue wave of pure, clear vomit, it's heading straight for you, BP oil industry. You'll try to shield yourself, hole up in your pristine beach estates, but it'll be there. That feeling on your skin that you can't wash off. All of Neptune's oceans won't help you now. No, not now. And yes, it's gushing toward your designer faucets. Sea turtles choking under your morning slippers, tar buckling under your bar quip limousines. It's heading straight for you, BP oil industry, our grief and anger. And we deeply regret you didn't see it coming. April 22nd, 2011, number nine. Satellite view, anywhere, USA. Parched, rectangle, a mall, M-A-U-L. Human beings shocked chemical bloodstreams, stand in for free Americans, shattering through sold out field of dreams. 
Chaos is normal when sheep have mad dogs on their heels. Anywhere USA, hardened jaws team over, devour anything alive, injected with toxins to profit their appetite, contracted carcasses form mammal junkyards, trashes dark blooms form faring states. And chaos is normal when sheep have mad dogs at their heels. In anywhere USA, sacred body isn't safe against onslaught of ignorance and misinformation. Sacred mind is rabbled and grabbed. And chaos is normal when sheep have mad dogs at their heels. If there's chaos, then now's the time for creation in anywhere USA. teaches us that language changes constantly, women remain gracefully beautiful, men continue to be brutal. It does not explain when that started or why. Mm -hmm. Uh, sacrifice. 
I wanted to write something that was uh, totally contemporary and modern and uh, of our times, but something that I hope Baudelaire would approve of. So uh, that was the idea here. It's called Sacrifice. There's a fire inside the mountain where a puma rests. On the continents of silence, the unfurnished living rooms in space, where now a sacrifice takes place. Behind the landmass of skeletons, the ice flows creep, long lines of leopards in the snow. It's time to go, to keep the logs keep burning in a hailstorm, the dust of the night and the stills, the windowsills are dirty, and hope trembles on the legs of a dying praying mantle. Solstice. Keep me now like this with the sun bleeding, passing Spanish hearts in my hands, the soft white flesh of a tender neck held back in two submission, the eyes full of resignation, pleading. Close me now like this forever. Shut the light, release the seas, the endless ocean voyages of melancholy ions flare and the fire. The bookshelves rise like a tower of the arcane world. You cling to a yellow sheet of silk cocoon. Excuse me. Like a wing of Baal's angels, the ancients. Press on your skull like a tumor, the manuscripts curl in a flame. And I light a light in the darkness. The cigarettes drop to the floor and they reappear, the long line <coughs> of leopards in the snow. It's time to go into a courtyard, into an unfurnished living room and space to make your grace beneath the jaws of a generous lion, teeth capped down to the bone, a layer of platinum, morphine, erotic waves of criminal water, with a bite to the juggler, you'll break on through, releasing the final vials of congenital poison, pints of blood, and endless millenniums of ocean voyages. Around the long view. <clears throat> static, static, and static. Static, static, static. No way to go this way. Give up on me. Have to go acoustic. Around the long view. <coughs> Point is you bear witness and lift what Yates helped to lift. As needed, as suffered, as built. It's the ears that jointly inspire to diminished fears, and later, I love this world, says Will, but I say nothing. Lay off, the spirit cannot abide. He's perfectly sincere. One should fold paper for a very long time. Yes, even if it should cost him Homer his job. <laughs> and every Trojan in Troy his dividends forever. Get your bearings now as steel wheels resonate several floors above your stripe. Later still, though we haven't met on any plane, they're beeping. There's no prattling worth finishing. <laughs> <laughs> 
no cosmetic for the kingdom. Hey, one more word on the, the energy situation. I wonder if uh, people saw in the Times Herald record today, while well, these frackers had their mind on squeezing the last bit of fossil fuel out, a company from China is coming to Fishkill and opening a solar technology plant that's saying they'll hire a thousand people. You know, what do those folks know that we don't? Yeah. Um, uh, uh, yeah, I need this one. <laughs> well, that too. The sea of profound green, which deep inside reflects beyond tomorrow, it reaches out again and again toward its old love, the moon, then spends itself in foam upon the shore where crabs without memory skitter blind. Thank you. You don't have short poems. This is a short poem. <laughs> I have short poems. This is a short poem. There you have it. And this is called Beat Scene. B E A T. Not B E E T. It's not a poem about vegetables. I don't generally write poems about vegetables. That's a lie. Although I did write a poem about George W. Bush one time. So, aha. Beat scene. That's pop art. Mr. Kerouac, listening to old tapes of you today and wonder, a time when you'd gather, talk about art, sing about art, play about in art. The entire scene was a group that would live for art and love for art. There didn't seem to be a need for money, at least no discussion about money, none that I knew about anyway. Now it's I don't have enough money. She doesn't have enough money. He doesn't have enough money. Nobody has enough money to live this life of art. And the ones that have it, well, they're not talking. I romanticize your struggle, Mr. Kerouac, the demons that were at play in your hidden thoughts, the strangers you encountered on the streets, red light, whiskey nights, go-go girls blazing with fiery lips and heroin. I sleep in smoky bars, squinting and dream of sounds. I dream of the horns and the shoe-tapping Harlem ten-cent beer parties and Miles and Dizzy and Bird and Billy. Billy stoned out on dark memories, brooding her past, scarred from beatings and prostitution abandonment, no love from men. I dream in black and white. And my skinny tie fantasy imagines the Times Square crowds that gathered for zany neon encounters with bohemian eccentrics, wild-eyed and telling stories of flight from police, back alley scuffles, full fist knockout brawls and left in the corner to bleed another poem, another prose, another hazy thought to create art with. Ginsburg is glorious and Hunky and Corso found themselves on the sunken boulevard Burrows, you standing alone, hands in pockets, on your own, always on your own, and old. All eyes are on Kerouac. My friend Janet knows. She lived the poem. She lived the days. East Village Post Beat, hippie art house, street cafes, smoking in clubs and fire-breathing surrealist images with Rothenberg, running with Maplethorpe and Patty. Janet Hamill, the genie of the alphabet. Janet Hamill. When your writers gathered and your painters gathered and your musicians gathered, all gathered to speak of the collaborative life and meaning, not money. In my 1984 New York, there were remnants of that which I describe, but no longer a possibility to drink, get drunk, and lay with. New York no longer affordable to the artists. The Village Voice read, New York to the arts. Get lost. What has happened to East Village, Ginsburg, New York? Thule's New York. 
sipping cappuccinos on McDougal Street, cafes buzzing and ideas and thoughts existed in breath and cigarette smoke, I envy. But if in my heart my spirit lifts and the moon continues to glow, then praise be made to the glory of children, and may the children teach us to live again. Thank you. in our head, forsaking the emotional minefield we pretend to tread, fearful of what lies beneath that beating, primitive beast, the shackles of fabricated knowledge, compressing genuine existence, crushing our basic instincts, our manufactured and replicated, sold to our souls for negative, sold to our souls for a steal of negative worth for mass consumption. For a small additional cost, you get the law of the land and the Eucharist in your hand. With all this demand and the supply going so fast, never mind breaking even, they're betting on a profit. The orders keep flooding in, but the stacks of the reserves are dwindling, they're making a killing. Who knew peddling rhetoric as fact could be so lucrative? I had acted early, secured my order before the mad dash, but in the name of brotherly love, I'll be your sacrificial lamb, and I'll give you mine back. If you need anything else, do not, do not hesitate to ask. Did I mention my bloods in the universal flask? In the name of the supply, the demand, and the martyr, amen. <laughs> You don't have to know the poems to understand the poem. So it's for Cesar Vallejo. I want to go on saying, no yo sé, no yo sé. No, I'm doing it backwards. I'm sorry, let me start that again. <laughs> I'm getting hungry. Okay, too much heaviness and I just, you know, start. I want to go on saying, yo no sé, yo no sé, yo no sé. My tight jaw needs loosening. Words are the only things that come out. What if each word grew leaf and flower? A garden where you and I would not think on death. A rainy day, welcome to water our skin, to rub your feet. Drain words poisoning you, render them harmless. Compost for orchid of unskilled wings. Your mother would give back the birth flesh she coveted and mine would caress the birth flesh she scarred. And those near bones in a coffin would rest. Heaven would rain down on hell, extremes erased for eternity. Your black ring, dark features, long coat. I could take them without fear of pain. My teeth chewing on your words of petals and seeds. You galloping on my waist, a wild horse to keep our freedom safe.